If you've got your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to turn to Matthew 25. We're going to look at the parable of the talents. And before I read this passage to you, I want to put it in its context. So I think context is important for our understanding of Scripture. Matthew, one of the things that the gospel writer Matthew likes to do is he likes to sandwich stories in between other stories. And so typically the middle story is a bridge narrative or a story that's going to take what the first one told, build on it a little bit, and then kind of lead you to the next story. And this parable is one of those sandwich parables. It occurs in the 25th chapter of Matthew between two other stories, one in which we looked at in the study guide last week. Any of you who've been reading the study guide, you would have read the story of the 10 bridesmaids. And the story that that occurs in the first few verses of this uh, gospel in Matthew 25 is intended to let everyone know that the message of the bridesmaids parable is to be prepared to not let the oil run out, to always be vigilant and to be watchful and to be prepared because you never know when the bridegroom is coming. And for example, you never know when God's coming. You never know when Christ is gonna appear and and want an account or to wanna be available to you. And so it's kind of, the, the idea is to be spiritually vigilant, okay? Then the story that occurs after the one we're gonna read this morning is one of judgment. And this whole idea is of whether or not we were faithful and help those who were sick and poor and imprisoned and what have you. It was kind of this separation narrative, if you will. And, and God is, is looking to us and there's an accountability. There's, an, there's a judgment at the end, if you will, that, that God is gonna come and ask us to give account uh, for what we did here on this, this earth. And that there's a reminder that when we do it for the least of these, it was as, as if we did it for the king himself, okay? This story in the middle is one that speaks to this coming judgment, but reminds us that there is a time of stewardship, if you will, and readiness or preparedness in which we live in now. And so it's the parable of the talents, and I wanna read it to you. Hear now the word of God. Jesus said, for it is as if a man going on a journey summoned up his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying this, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made you five more. The master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will now put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Next, the one who had had the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will now put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying this, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you not, that I reap where I did not sow and I gather where I did not scatter? scatter. Then you ought to have invested at least, at the very least, invested my money with the bankers, and upon my return I would have received what was my own with a little interest. So take the talent away from him and give it to the one with ten talents, for to those who have more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Such loving words from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yeah, I read this parable, and in years past, I, I would have approached it and said, you know, this is all about talent and abilities, but this passage is not about talent or ability. This passage is about resourcing. This passage is about money. 
Money's never mentioned here, but talent, the word we receive for talent here literally is a weight of measurement. And so it's debatable in terms of how much a talent would be worth. A talent is a weight, so what we're really talking about, what was it that was given in terms of weight? If it were gold, it would be worth one thing. If it were silver, it would be worth another. If it were land, it would be worth another, or copper, whatever. But the word talent here means weight. Now, if we believe that it was some sort of monetary value, which some interpreters will shift and say a large sum of money, they will interpret this passage to say. If we believe then it was weighted in some sort of value, dollar amount, if you will, a talent is somewhere equal to the wages you would earn working 4,500 days or 6,000 days. 4,500 to 6,000 days of daily wages. So if you're just kind of doing the math, that's about 15 to 20 years of salary that is entrusted in one talent. Now, when you consider that the average lifespan in this day and age was somewhere between 30 and 40, 10 to 12, maybe 15 years would be the amount of time that you would work. And so to say that there was 15 to 20 years worth of salary given to even the first person, all of a sudden, you read this a little differently, don't you? The first time I used to, when I used to read this, I would think, boy, the one guy that got one talent, he got ripped off. You know, it's not fair to him. He just had one talent. This other guy got two and, and five. But when you, when you consider how valuable a talent was, 15 to 20 years worth of salary and wages, it's a lifetime worth of work that's essentially being entrusted to the slaves. The word slave, doulos, that's used here, uh, some translators will interpret that servant, but I think slave is the better word here. These people didn't have a choice. They had probably been in this family for generations. That's why they were entrusted with the resources of the, of the king or of the master in this story. So Jesus tells this story about these resources that are divided up, and basically what the story says, I would love to be able to stand before you as your pastor and say, you are all created equal but you're not. You are all created equal in the eyes of God in terms of your value, but you all have been entrusted differently, haven't you? I mean, if you just look at our resources or our, what we're able to do or our, even our time, I'll give you a great example. Last year, I did a funeral for a 98-year-old woman. She had plenty of time, didn't she? Some of us won't get that much time some will be taken away before their time. So time isn't something that we're given equally. We're not given time equally. Money, we're not given resources, money equally. We have people in our church that, that are very, very wealthy, extremely wealthy, have lots and lots of money, can just kind of tomorrow could say, hey, we're leaving for 20 days to Bora Bora and just get on a plane and go. I mean, without any repercussions financially, just go do it. Others in this church live in literally paycheck to paycheck. We have, we've had members of our church literally that were homeless when they came to become part of this church. So, so money is not, we're not given equal resources in terms of our assets, our financial wherewithal. And we're not given the same talents. Some of you can sing really, really well. The rest of you, no, not so much. Yeah, and I, just so you know where I put myself, I put myself in that second group, not so much. I mean, I've told you guys this many times, I don't sing very well, but I make up for it by singing loud. So what we have entrusted to us is, is not equal. We're not equally gifted. We have different gifts. Um, if you've got your bulletin, hopefully you noticed the study guide. I wanna just call your attention to something. I'm not gonna walk through it now, but, but I hope you'll take time to read the study guide this week and to do the family devotions because on Tuesday, you're gonna read the passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and it talks about, it equates gifts, the spiritual gifts in the church to a body and the different parts of the body and how they're all important and used by the whole body for the, for the betterment of the body. And so the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you and vice versa, okay? It's important for us to know uh, that we're all needed. We're all needed, if you will. As we look at this passage, there's a couple things that, that I think are truths in this. And if you wanna write them down, things to remember, I think it's important. The first thing to remember in this passage is we're not all given the same gifts. 
We're not all given the same talents. We're not all, some of us are given um, even more talents. I, I say this all the time. I'll run into other pastors around the conference and they'll say, hey, we're hearing some great things are happening at Argyle Methodist Church. And I'll say, yeah, God is doing some amazing things. And they'll say, well, how do you guys do it? And I'll say all the time, I said, I got a five talent church. In the early years, I used to say we had a two talent church, but I've upgraded to five talent. Hey, we have a five talent church, all right? We have a five talent church. And they'll look at me kind of weird. I'll say, man, we've got people that know how to get things done. We have people that have resources and are generous in their giving. We have people that are generous in their time commitments to the church and volunteering and serving. I said, we, we have a five talent church. I said, I said, but at the same time, I think God expects much from us. It will not do to come back to God and say, well, you gave us all these talents and we were mediocre. I think, I think God expects Argyle United Methodist Church to be exceptional, I believe that. I think we in our hearts believe we are to be a leader, not only in our community, but within our conference and our denomination to be a leader. What would that look like? You know, when I read this story, one of the tough things to hear in the story is that um, the one who is punished is the one who won't try. The one who is punished is the one who chooses not to participate. I don't know if you get that in this story. But um, about eight years ago, uh, someone came into my office and said, hey, did you hear that so-and-so is going to leave the church? And they're telling me somebody had been around the church for a long time was going to leave. And they were all worried, and several people came to the office and got several emails and calls. Did you hear, oh, so-and-so is going to leave? Their, this couple is going to leave the church, and, and, oh, this is going to be terrible for us. And what do you think, Pastor? What do you think? And I said, um, we're not going to miss them. I'm, I'm telling you what I said. I kind of confessing, they said, we're not gonna miss them. And they said, what, what are you talking about? We're not gonna miss them. I said, they didn't participate. They were non-participants. I'm telling you, we're not gonna miss them. And guess what? We haven't missed them. I'll tell you what I, I haven't missed. I haven't missed those nasty emails I used to get from the wife because she didn't like the way I preached. She said, if I preached more like Joel Osteen, I'd be a better preacher. <laughs> Maybe I would be, I don't know. Um, I told her to move to Houston. Um, yeah, you guys are seeing another side of me here for just a moment. Some of you are going, well, Pastor, that somebody, I want you to hear what I'm saying here. Somebody at the early service said, Pastor, I hope you're one of the people that, I hope we're the couple that you love. And I said, I didn't say anything about love. I said, I didn't miss them. There's a difference. I love them. I loved them then. I love them today. We haven't missed them. I ask you, would we miss you if you left this church? Do you participate enough in the ministries? Would we miss you? It's a simple question. The reason I'm asking the question is because in this parable, the question is essentially being begged. The one with the one talent who didn't use it is the one that's punished, and that one isn't missed. It sounds harsh for the pastor, because you guys know me, I'm Mr. Love Everybody, kumbaya, right? And, and for me to say, I'm not saying we won't miss you. I'm asking you to ask the question of yourself. Would my church miss me? If, let's, let's put it on as a church. If Argyle United Methodist Church closed its doors today, would Denton County miss us? Would they miss us? Have we been that influential in a positive and loving way, advancing the gospel of Christ, meeting the needs of those who are suffering, seeking and feeding the spiritual hunger? Would they miss us if we closed our doors? A friend of mine was talking about how they were looking for a church, and it was two doors down from the business that they had stopped. They said, hey, do you know where the church is? And the person at the convenience store said, I never heard of it. It was two doors down. So I wanna ask you the question. I don't know if you have one talent or two talents or five talents. The question is this, would this mission field, would the community, would Argyle United Methodist Church miss you if you just walked out one day never to return? The third thing that is important for us to hear in this passage, and I love it, because it goes to the response, if you will, of the master when the slaves are asked to give account. The slave with the five talents is approached or comes back to the master and says, hey, 
Um, I made you five more. And the master says this, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You've been trustworthy with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many. Here's the truth. The reward for work well done is more work to do. So here's what's happened, Argyle United Methodist Church, members and regular attenders of Argyle United Methodist Church. As we have grown, do you know what the, uh, the denomination has asked of us since we've grown? They've asked more from us. So the reward for work well done is that now the conference is coming to us and saying, hey, we hear you guys run a phenomenal vacation Bible school. Um, will you not only lead your VBS, but will you teach other churches how to do VBS? Hey, we understand that you guys relocated a historic church and you're already um, in the process of, of building out a phase two within a five-year period of time. Would you teach us how to do that? They're already coming to us. Guys, the reward for work well done is more work to do. That's because this passage isn't just talking about money. It's talking about kingdom work. And basically what the master's asking each of us to do is, hey, I've entrusted you with some gifts and talents. You, you have one talent, you have two talents, you have five talents. Trust me, I'm looking at a lot of five talented people here. And God is saying, I want, I want you to invest what I've given you in my kingdom work. It will not do, friends, to look at others and to just copy them or to cheat off them. I'll give you a story I ran into a while back. A little boy named Richie got called into the principal's office. His teacher, after having received the written exam back from all the class, said, uh, looks like Richie's cheating. And so they called Richie into the office and the teacher said to Richie, said, uh, it appears that you've been te cheating, cheat, cheat, cheating off Johnny. It's easy for him to say. You've been cheating off Johnny. Richie was kind of a shrewd kid. He said, no, I haven't been cheating. I'm a smart kid. I, uh, Johnny's cheating off me. Teacher said, no, the, the proof's in the pudding. I've gone through the whole test, and every answer that Johnny put, you put. He said, again, that doesn't prove anything. I, I, you know me. I, Johnny's been cheating off me. And teacher said, no, no, no. On question number four, it asked, what did Sally do at the park? And Johnny wrote down, I have no idea. Your answer was, neither do I. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that you were cheating off Johnny. I share that with you because it doesn't do for us to look over at other people and say, you know, well, well they've got the answer. They've got this talent. They've got that. And, and I'll just rely upon them. This church won't miss me. And we do. And here's the thing. The pastor may not notice but in the story, the master does. In the classroom, the teacher notices. The principal notices. And I share that to you not to say that, oh, God is watching, watch out, look out. I share that to you to say, man, be thankful that God is watching and notices because it means it's important and it means you're important. And it means that God wants your best effort not some facsimile of someone else's. I, um, I think it's important that we understand that talents are unique in this way. There's kind of a universal principle here that the more you use a talent, typically the more proficient you become at using it and the more good comes out of your use. And conversely, the other is true, that the less you use it, the more likely you are to lose it. We had a world-class violinist in our church and about six years ago, eight, actually, no, it's been 10 years, it was an 02, um, he was working with a, a saw blade and severed the tendon and the nerves on the hand that he needs to push down on the strings. And all of a sudden, he went from being a second chair and a amazing orchestra to not being able to use that talent and he said pastor you know when you talked about talents this morning I, I think about what I wouldn't give to be able to play that bow and those strings again on that violin what I wouldn't give to be able to use that talent 
what I wouldn't give to go back and just not have had that saw blade take the, the nerve endings up from my finger. And I said, you know what? You still have that beautiful voice. Yeah, you can't play that violin anymore. But you still have that beautiful voice. It's real easy for us to see what we've lost or to think and look at what we don't have or we don't think we have and to, to be like that third slave that just buries it and says, well, if I at least give God back what I originally had, but friends, it's not good enough. God wants us to use our gifts and our talents and our graces to further the kingdom, to advance the gospel. And so all of you should have received a leaf in your bulletin. Did everybody get the leaf? I lost my leaf, there's my leaf. Here's what I'm gonna ask you to consider. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come up and during our offer time, offering time and time of reflection, I would like um, to ask each of you to, to take out a pen. Maybe you only have one leaf for like a family or whatever. You can all write on the same leaf if you want. And I want you to prayerfully think about over the next few minutes, what is that gift or that talent that, that you know has been kind of sitting on the sidelines? And you've come up with a real good excuse for why you're not employing that talent or that gift or whatever. But, but you know in your heart there is an opportunity. You've been gifted and entrusted with something. And friends, I, here's how I want you to understand the talent that you write on this leaf. Last week I told you that one of the biggest problems we have with our understanding of time is we like to compartmentalize it. And we say, all right, here's God's time. Here's my relationships. Here's my work. And the only thing that will ever free us from that compulsion or that that fear or that guilt that we feel for not doing enough in this God moment or these sacred moments is to understand that it was all God's to begin with? What if we were to look at our talents and our abilities in the same way and we realized it isn't my gift, it's God's gift entrusted to me? And how might I use that for the building of the kingdom? And some of you may think, well, I, I know I have the gift of teaching, but pastor, I'm not gonna stand up at that microphone and, and I'm not saying that when you put a leaf out on the giving tree out there that you're not gonna, I'm gonna say, oh, old Joe, he put preaching, so I'm signing him up for the two weeks in January that I'm gonna be out of town or whatever. I'm not talking about that, but, but maybe teaching is in another venue. Maybe it's writing the study guides, participating in a team. Maybe it's helping Liz with curriculum and children's ministry, whatever. So I wanna invite you to, to write down that gift, that talent, you know it in your heart, Somebody's told you, and you know that you've got the ability to do that, and, and I'm not asking you to, you're not, by putting it on the leaf, you're not signing up for anything, okay? It isn't about doing more. It's about being faithful with what you have. And so I want you to just begin this week and this Thanksgiving um, by just giving thanks to God for that talent. You know what I found in my life? Is the more mindful I am of all that I have, that it was really God's to begin with, and it still is God's, I become more thankful, and the more thankful I am, the better use I make of those gifts. Just as natural. I think it's kind of a divine plan, if you will. So I invite you just to begin, not by signing up and saying, oh, I gotta serve 10 more hours a month in the church. That's not what we're asking. I'm just asking you to begin by saying thanks to God for the gift that you've been given, and ask God how you might use it for his glory. Can we do that? Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the gifts that you entrusted to us. We have many talents and many gifts, and they're all around us because our friends and family are gifted too. But these gifts were never intended to be just held close or put on the shelf, never to be used. For your story tells us the reward for work well done is still more kingdom work to do. And so, Lord, we want to we wanna be about your work. We don't want to be the one who didn't try. So Lord, we offer our gifts to you, our talents to you, because we know that whether they're one or two or five, boy, even the one is worth a lifetime of wages. We don't want to waste the one lifetime we're given here on this earth for you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.